Josie, thank you for joining us today and being willing to be our first person. I was worried that we wouldn't get you this year with our closing tomorrow, so I'm so glad that you were able to make this work for yourself. So thank Me too. You. Thank you. Josie, we have just a short hour and um, a little less now, so let's, we'll get started. Your parents, Fanny and Jacques Eisenberg, were married in early 1938. You were born in March 1939, just months before Germany and Russia attacked Poland, beginning World War II. Tell us about your parents and their life in Brussels in that pre-war time, before the war began. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as I know, my parents, as you mentioned, were married in 1938. They were really newlyweds, and I was, I was born a year later. Um, prior to my being born, my, both my parents had professions. They were comfortable in Belgium. There was a lot of assimilation. The Jews in, in Belgium felt very comfortable um, in the atmosphere. They were acculturated and assimilated and felt quite comfortable. And um, I think, really, they didn't realize what was going to be coming mm -hmm. ahead. Uh, we saw in the beginning, the very first photograph in our presentation about you, you're a little girl in that dress. I don't know if anybody noticed it, but the, there are pockets. They look like potted plants. Uh, your mother made that. Yes. But your mother, that, that was part of her occupation. Yes. My mom was a designer, a dress designer. And actually, she went to kind of like a textile academy uh, where you learn how to design, how to use cloth. And at graduation, the royal family in Belgium would come and pick out a few students who they wanted to work in the royal household. My mom was one of those. So she worked in the royal household, which she was very proud of. It was a big deal. Yeah, that's a big deal. And uh, so my mom was designing clothes. And um, really, as you see, most of the pictures on the slideshow, really, that I'm wearing are made and designed by her. How about your father? My dad was a tailor. Um, however, he did not start out as a tailor. He was a violinist. And um, in Europe, in those days, you know, the movies in the 20s and 30s, the actors did not talk. So because there were no talkies, they usually had a quartet, musicians, a, a violinist, a viola, maybe a cello and, and another instrument. And they would play while the picture was being shown, while the movie was being shown. And so my dad has a job. He was working in movie houses. However, the talkies came in, and all these people lost their jobs. Um, they no longer accompanied the silent movies. So my dad went to school, actually, and learned to be a tailor. And that's the, both of them were actually in designing and clothing industry. Mm -hmm. Josie, um, in, in, um, in late 1938, November 1938, in Germany and Austria, there, what we call Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass, when there was um, assaults on Jewish businesses, mm -hmm. 30,000 Jewish men were arrested, over 300 synagogues, um, um, were burned during that, that, that night, a terrible, terrible night. As a result of that, uh, I think you ended up sheltering a Jewish child in your home in Belgium. My grandparents and, and my mom did. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was actually part of the underground, and she would often have some Jewish uh, people who had been fleeing from other countries in Europe where the Germans had already... Uh, invaded or become part of the, um, the government there. So there were some young Jewish people who were looking for safer places to live. So my mom would often house some of them and they would be housed with her for a while till they found a safer place to move on. Yeah. The war began with the attack, the German attack on Poland, September 1st, 1939. But it didn't really affect your country until May of 1940, right. when, um, when Germany invaded what we call the lowlands, including Belgium, the yes. Netherlands, and France. 
Your father left to join the British Army just before the Germans invaded Belgium. Tell us some, um, what, what you know about your father's decision to do that and then what that meant for your mother and you. Sure. Um, it was rumored in the Jewish community in Belgium that when the Germans were to invade, it was thought that they would only arrest the men and leave the women and children alone. So my parents had been listening to the radio continuously, especially the BBC, and there um, the British people were asking people to volunteer to join the British Army to fight against the Germans. And because my dad at that time thought that my mom and I would be safe, mm -hmm. um, he decided to volunteer, and he and his brother, my Uncle Ben, who was also a tailor, decided to go to England and to volunteer to be in the British Army. And actually, they left Belgium on one of the last boats to leave and to cross the English Channel. Before the Germans came in. Before the Germans came in. Once he left, the, the Germans came in right away. Did your yes. mom hear anything no. from him? No. We had no contact whatsoever. In fact, my mom really didn't know if he ever made it or not. No contact, right. and um, mm. my mom and I were living with my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, and uh, we kind of made do on our own. Um, my mom had really no one to support her, and so she was living with her parents as I was also. Mm -hmm. Was she able to work during that time in the early part of the occupation? As far as I know, she did not. She did not. Mm. No. And you would, you would, you and your mother with your grandparents would live under the German occupation until 1942. Yes. And that's So that was for the better part of um, uh, two years. Yes. Um, and then your mother made the very profound decision to place you into hiding. Tell us what you can about the events that led up to her making that decision, yeah. uh, and then what it was like for both of you, uh, for you to go somewhere else, to be hidden, and then what you know of what it was like for your mother. Sure. Um, as you said, my mom made the profound decision to actually put me into hiding, not... Sorry, not knowing uh, if she'd ever see me again. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't allowed to know where they were going to put me. Um, the Belgium, because she had connections with the underground, she was able to get someone to come and pick me up. Um, and it was decided by the Belgium underground, the people who were the resistance fighting against the Germans, kind of doing secret things. Um, it was decided the parents were not allowed to know where their children were being hidden because they knew when the Germans would come and arrest you at your apartment, thank you, um, at your apartment, um, they would torture you till they were able, you know, the Germans would say, where's the rest of your family? Where's your husband? Where are the children? Where's anyone? And they would torture you till they got it out of you. And they just, the underground decided that if the parents didn't know where their children were being placed, there was no way they'd be able to tell them. And therefore, my mother really did not know where I was, how long I'd be there, if she'd ever see me again. I realize now how, how extremely difficult that must have been for her, you know, having children on my own and grandchildren. Um, but one day, um, these two ladies who I didn't know came to our house, to our apartment, um, and came to pick me up. And I, from what I understand, I was screaming and crying. I didn't know these people. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave my mom and my grandparents. And um, they took me to a city called Bruges. Um, which is in Belgium, as you notice, mm -hmm. saw on the map. Um, it is full of canals and full of convents. And in fact, it's called the Venice of Belgium. It's beautiful. It's really full of canals. And um, I was placed in a convent uh, with nuns and um, full of other children. 
As far as I know, after the war, I found out that of all the children being there, there were three other Jewish children and, and myself. So we were four Jewish children altogether being hidden there. The rest were children from, from the area. It was more like an orphanage and people, because food was rationed, there was very little food and conditions were pretty difficult. So people would put their children in an orphanage and hope that they would pick them up when things got a little bit easier and better. So this orphanage was full of kids and, um, and four Jewish children that these nuns were hiding. I want to I come back to have you tell us more about what it was, from what you know, about sure. what it was like to be there. Um, but before, I want to ask you a couple of questions. You, have, you do have some fleeting memories of when you were young. And one of them you shared with me, you were on a bus with your mother. Um, will, you, will you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, once the Germans came in, you know, people, we pretty much stayed in our apartment. We had an attic apartment. Um, and we pretty much stayed to ourselves. Once the Germans invaded and took over, um, you know, everybody had to have an identification card. And in it was stated if you were a Jew or not. There was a large J, and it usually said Juden, which is Jew in German. Everybody had to have an identification card. So when you walked on the street, the Germans could just stop you and say, show me your identification card. And it was up to them, their choice, what they would do with you, either arrest you, deport you, or take you away. Uh, one day, my mom and I decided to go on an outing. We did very, very seldomly. We went on an outing and we got on a tram, like a trolley, not a bus, but you know, one of these connected electrically to cables. So we got on a tram, my mom and I, and we went to the last row to sit down and watching the view and seeing things that were going on. During the trip, um, a German officer got onto the tram and was asking for everybody's identification card. And he was going row by row by row. And my mom was actually, I was sitting next to her. I was only three years old and I, my mom was shaking. And I really didn't know why. I, I really didn't understand why. The officer came from row to row, and he got to the last row where my mom and I were sitting, and he turned around and left. And I thought, oh my God, somebody must have been watching over us. And of course, I didn't know why my mom was shaking. I really didn't understand. But that was one of the really close calls you, I had. You remember that. Too. That I remember. You, you shared with us that your mother was active in the resistance. Do you know, do you know what she did? Do uh, you have any idea? I know she also delivered leaflets, mm -hmm. meetings. Um, you know, she would gather people, tell them where to go, what time, and everything else. I mean, the, 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 the act of just delivering uh, an anti-German leaflet yeah. was, was dangerous. Pun punishable by death. Yeah. Um, Tell us, during that time, of course, the deportations had really begun in yes. earnest. Um, and tell us what happened to your grandparents. And if I remember correctly, you still had, at that time, uh, great-grandparents um, were still alive. Um, my father's parents mm -hmm. uh, were alive. Um, and my mother's grandparents, I'm not sure yeah. of. What happened to your grandparents? My grandparents, well, my mother and her parents were arrested. Um, my father, my grandfather was not arrested at the same time. He was arrested a little while shortly before my, my mom and grandmother were arrested. Um, from Belgium, you know, there were many concentration camps all over Poland and in different countries in Eastern Europe. And, um, but from Belgium, my understanding is that all the Jews who were arrested and deported, they all went to Auschwitz. They took them all to Auschwitz. So my, my grandfather um, and my mom and grandmother were arrested and taken 
they were deported to Auschwitz. And your, your, your mother was, was denounced, as best yes. you know, right? You know, there were many, many Christian people who really, really helped. They hid the Jews, they helped us. I mean, you know, if you were found on the street hiding a Jew, there would be no questions asked. The German would just shoot you. The same thing goes for the convent where I was. The nuns um, would have been killed. They would have been shot. I always say, you know, these nuns were very, very strict. They really were. Um, they were dressed like the nuns in The Sound of Music, really. But they weren't like the nuns. They weren't like that. <laughs> and as I always say, they didn't sing either. Uh, <laughs> but they saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was thinking, I was only three years old. A three-year-old child just wants to be held and hugged, and they didn't do that. Um, and I don't think it's because they didn't like us. They were like that with all the kids, not just because I was Jewish. They were really kind of cold and pretty strict with all the kids. And maybe it was because of the, what they were wearing, that gear that was pretty stiff. Uh, <laughs> you know, nuns today, I think we're clothes like we do. Whereas then they were very, very different. Mm -hmm. uh, so they saved my life. They really did. They were very strict, but they did save my life. But you did, you, in, in absolutely, in, but one of the things you shared with me is that, um, that the, probably the most significant impact besides saving your life was just the, the lack of being nurtured yeah. and held, and that, that had a big impact on you. But I was also struck, you said that um, you think what was so important is that you'd, you'd had that nurturing yeah. before. Will yeah. you say a little bit about that? Sure. I, I'm a strong believer in the need for a child to bond uh, with a caretaker. Doesn't necessarily have to be a parent, but it could be a caretaker. It's usually a parent, but very often it's not. And I really feel that, you know, a child needs that special nurturing, bonding, knowing, a child knowing that there's somebody is there to take care for, of you at all times, no matter what. And I really feel I had that very strong nurturing for the first three years of my life with my grandpa, my grandmother especially, and my mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really had that very strong bond. So I feel that nurturing really stood me well for what was to, what was to, what was to come. Yeah. Yes. You, um, your name was changed. Yes. Uh, to Van Berg, I believe. Yes. Was there something significant about that name? It was, because it, my name before Eisenberg was very much a Jewish name, and uh, it was changed to Van Berg, which is more like a Dutch name. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Belgium is bilingual. It's Flemish and French, Flemish being more like Dutch. And um, so my name was changed so that it would be more... Uh, non-Jewish. Mm -hmm. and, and was there any distinction between being Flemish or French? Did that matter? Uh, no, it did not. No, okay. No. Josie, at, at some point, of course, the nuns who'd been caring for you, they made the decision to, to take you out of the convent. Yes. And what do you know about that decision? As, as far as I know, um, after being there for six months, the nuns found out that the Germans, the Nazis, were going to come and pick up the four Jewish children. And, of course, not knowing what would happen to us, the nuns, when the Germans did come and to pick us up, the nuns actually said, you know, the children aren't ready, we need to get their clothes ready and everything else. Come back the next day. And during, during that night, the nuns actually smuggled the four of us out the four Jewish children, and took us to Brussels, which is where I was originally from. Mm. Placed each one of us, I don't know where the other three were placed, but I was placed with a Christian family, and you saw them on the screen. Uh, their name was de Bracelaire. And um, I was placed with them and actually stayed with them for the remainder of the war. 
And, and tell us about the Dubrocolaire family. What do you know about them, and what do you remember of your time with them? Because it was a, a fairly lengthy period. Yes, it was. Um, the Dubrocolaires were um, a, a husband, a wife, and a little girl my age. And um, the man was very involved. These were Catholic people. The man was very involved in the resistance, also in the underground. And he would often be taken out of his home, of his apartment, and be taken out for interrogation. And he would come back black and blue because they would really, they would torture him. He never told on me, nor did he ever tell on what things he was involved with. So they were all so really risking their lives. Also, you know, food was rationed in Belgium. Um, you would pick up um, the, a basic amount of food you would pick up once a week at one of these food centers. And you would pick up for however many people were in your household. And there were three of them. I was there illegally. So they picked up food um, for three people. And they would, of course, always share it with me. Um, they never told on me. They protected me. And um, I was very, very fortunate to be there. The, 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 other, the third person was their daughter who was, I think... My age. Your age. What do, what do you remember about her? Well, we played all the time. Uh, we really never went out. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really kind of played. The two of us were little playmates. And um, that was pretty much it. Do you know, do you know if, um, if you... If you were, if neighbors knew that there was a fourth person there, thought it was a maybe a relative of theirs, or, re, or were you unknown to others? Do you know? You know, I don't think anybody knew. Okay. We 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 never went out. We never went out. And uh, we were pretty much indoors most of the time. Do you, do you have any recollection of what that was like for you, a little girl, um, to essentially be locked locked in a house all the time and not able to go out for a very long yeah. time? I was, you know, these people, as I mentioned before, risked their lives, they fed me, they made sure I was safe, mm -hmm. but I never really felt like I was part of the unit. Uh, you know, you feel that. Mm -hmm. uh, the parents and the little girl were very close, and as I said, they weren't mean to me, they fed me, I was safe, but I wasn't part of the unit. So that, again, the, the nurturing that you would yeah. get from a family unit, you would hope you would get from a family unit. Which I did not. You did not. And I don't think they mean, they didn't mean harm. Mm -hmm. They just, I was just not part of it. And it could have been just my own feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you felt that and you- I you, did you feel that. To this day. Yeah. So the Dubrocolaires protected you and took care of you until the, until the war's end. Yes. Which, um, which in Belgium was in the fall of 1944 yes. when Belgium was liberated. Right. Your Aunt Teresa, one of your mother's sisters, was able to find you. What do you know about how she was able to find you uh, and what that meant for you? Sure. My, my mom had two sisters uh, who actually were hidden by the underground. They were, all, they were hidden in churches. Uh, my one Aunt Therese uh, had three sons. She's the one who came to get you. Right? She's the one who came to get me. Um, as I was saying, they were they were hidden in churches and they were protected and they were safe. Um, but they were hidden through the underground, and you know the underground was like a whole networking. You could find people if you were part of the underground. Somehow there was a network. You could find someone. And they were able to find me. My one Aunt Therese was able to find me. She went to the apartment where I was hidden and took me to her home, and which was wonderful because, you know, it was, I was with family. She had three sons, my three cousins, three brothers, um, and they were just a little bit older than me. And they, once I was with them, they spoiled me rotten. It was fantastic being with family again. It was really great. They, I think I was like their little mascot. And I was, and they played around with me and it was wonderful. 
And um, I stayed with them actually till the end of the war. Till the end of the war, which was which didn't occur until the following May of night. Right. So for the better part of about eight or nine months during that time. Tell us, you uh, I don't know if it was Aunt Teresa's husband. You had an uncle. Yes, uh, Uncle Morris. Yeah, tell him. My my uncle, my Aunt Teresa's husband, after the war got special citations and decorations because he actually captured and killed Germans. He was part of the underground. This is a very shy, meek man. Nobody in the family could believe it. Um, I mean, he was quite strong in the underground. It was quite amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, all that came out much All later. that came out. <laughs> yeah. What about yes. your other aunt, she, my, who also survived? Yes, yeah, she also survived. She was... My my mom had two sisters, and each one was five years. They were five years apart. So my aunt Rose was younger than my mom was five years older, and my aunt Therese five years older than that. She also was hidden in a church, and um, really we were very lucky mm -hmm. that our family was really hidden in churches. Really Christian people came out and really helped the Jews. But as mentioned before, not all not all the population in Belgium was helping with the Jews. There were many people who did not. Like our neighbor actually, like you mentioned, denounced my mother. Um, Which meant going to the authorities and saying, yes. there's a Jewish woman in that house. Yeah. Right. And sometimes people would get paid or they would just, you know, be on the side of the Germans. And so my mom was actually denounced by our neighbor, but there were so many people that did help Jews, really. The, um, when, when the war ended for you in, in the fall of 1945, uh, 1944, excuse me, Yes. but the war did continue for another nine months. Do yes. you know, was your, were your aunts and, and family that found you, were they able to have sort of a, a sense of normalcy, even though the war was going on. There must have been worries, for example, that the Germans could come back. I don't of know course. that there were, but do you know what that time was like for everybody? Well, I think people were very much on edge mm -hmm. because really they didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what happened to my mom. They had no idea, nor their parents, my Aunt Therese's parents. Um, people really, it was a very difficult time. There was some normalcy, but you kind of follow through with your routine and with your life, and people were able to work, but people didn't know where other family members and, were. And conditions had to still be difficult with yeah. food and, and things like that during, sure. during that time. So it, 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 must, it must have seemed like a miracle that your mother, your mother Fanny survived um, Auschwitz, she returned to Brussels after her liberation in April 1945 and was reunited with you and her yes. sisters. You were six. You hadn't seen your mother in three years. Yes. What do you remember of what that was like? And, and then tell us how your mother survived, how she came back. Um, as you heard, my mother did survive. Um, she's still alive. She's 101 years old. 101. She volunteers at the museum every Sunday, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, she was actually liberated by the Russians. One of the last battles between the Germans and the Russians at the Elbe River. And she was taken by the Russians and the Red Cross. She was a pretty sick woman. She weighed about 65 pounds and she had typhus and meningitis. She was taken by the Red Cross and treated, and eventually they brought her back to, to Brussels, to Belgium. And the first place she went was my, her sister's apartment, which is where I was. And she knocked on the door, and there I was. So... That must have been just extraordinary. Yeah. And I know it's very painful to even... You know, it's been quite a number of years and I still cry. 
So please forgive me. Well, I think everybody understands it, that. Your, 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 your mother's ordeal was horrific. She, yeah. she was subjected to medical experimentation at Auschwitz. She was, and she worked in a factory. She, you know, most concentration camps were killing centers. You got there and they killed you. Auschwitz had a sub camp, a labor camp, a beer canal, where they actually made ammunition, which, you know, Germany was very, very enthusiastic about. They were really building up for the war. And so as soon as my mother and her mother, actually, when they were deported and put on a cattle train, as soon as they were deported and taken to Auschwitz, when they got off the train, the cattle car, there was a selection immediately. There were guards and dogs separating you in lines, putting the younger people who they felt could work in one line, and the older folks are the people with children in another line. Because they felt if you had a child and the child would cry, you'd go to the child first rather than do your work. So my mom and her mom were separated immediately at the selection line. And my mom went to be with her mother. And the Germans saw that. And he really, he hit her pretty badly. And he said, you go where you're told. Um, and so she had to go back online, and she never saw her mother again. Her mom was killed. My grandma was killed immediately. But my mom survived. She worked in this ammunition factory, filling grenades and bombs with chemicals. And she somehow, she survived. And when she, she was liberated, I think, in April, but it took, it, she had to go to the She was on a, and she, yes, also she was on a death march. And she was on a death march before that? She was on a death march for, from January to April. Um, that's when they, the Germans, once they realized the Allies were approaching, tried to empty some of their concentration camps and made the prisoners really walk back towards Germany. There were still labor camps who they thought people could work in. So they took people out, gave them each a blanket, and they marched day and night. And my mom marched from January to April, when she was actually liberated by the Russians. They marched without food. They would just pick up scraps on the ground, peels, grass, whatever they could find. And um, that's how they survived. And you know, it's amazing to me that my mom did survive. And she got to you, in, in, it was not until June that she got to you. What did your mom do once she was back home and reunited with you? What was she, without her husband, yeah. what did she do? We actually, we went back to her apartment mm -hmm. where my parents lived and I, um, and we stayed there until my dad eventually came back. Which is another extraordinary thing that happened. Yeah. When did your father come back and tell us what he'd been through? Yeah, my dad, um, you know, was, my dad, when he got to England, by the way, the British kind of evaluated these, my uncle and my dad, and they put them both in a factory making British uniforms, which was probably the best place they could be. However, you've probably heard about England and London, how they had bombing by the Germans, especially the Blitz. My dad was living in an apartment in London and his house was bombed. So even though the war ended, he had to stay, he was in the hospital for two years. He was injured pretty badly. Mm -hmm. And he didn't come back until 1946. I was seven years old. You, you remember when he came back, you <laughs> met, right? Yeah, I met him kind of for the first time right. because he left when I was 13 months old and I really had no recollection of him. Um, we went to the port city in Belgium, Ostend, where the ships come in after crossing the channel and we went to meet his ship, my mom and I, and uh, my mom saw this man coming down um, I distinctly remember he was wearing a hat. In those days, all the men wore hats. Um, and this man came down these steps, and my mom said, there's your father. And that was my dad. And um, 
Mm. That's how we kind of were reunited. Did, do you know at what point your, when your mother learned that he was one alive and that he was coming home? Um, it was at, at the end of the war. When so the she war did, ended. She did learn then that he was yes, alive. Yes, they started corresponding. Yeah. Uh, my, my dad and my mom wrote to each other. They couldn't before because letters couldn't be sent. Um, so we found out he was alive and he did eventually yeah, come back. But after another year. Yeah. Once you were reunited, it would take another three years before you were able to move to the United States yes. in 1949. What was that time like for your, your family? Um, how did your family make go back to earning a living, make ends meet? What was that time like for well, you? Well, before my dad went to England, um, we had, my dad had a tailor shop, a tailoring shop, where you, you know, a person who would want a suit, they didn't just go like Macy's or Bloomingdale's and get a ready-made suit. You would, the, a person would come in and pick out the bolt, the kind of material they wanted, you know, tweed or whatever they wanted, and they would pick a style of suit. My dad would make a pattern in paper, cut it out, and the person, the customer, would come a few weeks, a duration before the suit was made, because they would come for fittings, for cuttings, for all kinds of things. So my dad had this tailoring shop at the bottom of the apartment. The apartment building had four floors, with the top being the attic where we lived. The bottom was the store. So once my, my parents got reunited, um, the store was opened again, and my dad started working. He made suits, people, customers mm -hmm. came in, and um, it was very difficult becoming, really adapting to each other again. Don't forget my dad didn't have a child until seven, I was seven years old. So he meets this kid who was seven, and not having experience with a child, my mom had gone really through hell, and I was kind of caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I think it was hard for the three it, of us, it had you to know. Be. Yeah, I, it was very hard. And my parents realized or decided that they really did not want to stay in Europe after everything that had happened and uh, decided that they wanted to come to the United States. And it took, a, it took that long? It took that long, 49. My dad and his brother, with his family, we all came together on the same boat. We all immigrated, had our papers, but it took a number of years, and we all got to the United States. So you would come to the United States, pick up your lives, move here. What was that like for, the, for all of you? Well, fortunately, my mom had an elderly aunt in uh, New Jersey, in Patterson, as you mentioned. And you know, you usually gravitate where you have a relative. So we actually moved in with her, my mom, my dad, and I. And uh, we, we lived in, a room, in an apartment there with her until my parents found work. A month later, we had our own apartment. My parents had jobs. And um, I started school, and we learned English because I didn't know one word. Did your parents? Well, your father. My dad your father did, did a did little it. bit. My mom did not, no. but she she learned. My parents were so enthusiastic about becoming Americans; they immediately enrolled in high school night classes. They both your parents did that. Both my parents. They they learned English. They learned all the states and all the capitals, all the presidents more than I do know, but I, you know, they were very, it was important for them to be here, to belong, to be citizens. You, you, you had a little bit of a rough start. You, um, yeah. you, I think on your first day of school, you got beat up by a group of girls. Yes. And your mom, um, very upset, went, went to the principal. Yes, she did. The, my first day of school, you know, I was, I was 10 years old when I came, and they put me in first grade because I didn't know a word of English. You know, and they think, you know, you don't know English. You probably don't know very much. So, yeah. <laughs> so they put Must me in first grade. Right, start at the beginning with all the first graders. That's right. So I was there for about two weeks. 
Then it, I got to second grade and third grade, and I finally caught up. So I was okay. However, my first day in school there, not knowing a word of English, um, when I got outside of school, in school, you know, at the end of the day, I got out of school, and there was a group of girls waiting for me, and they beat me up. And I couldn't understand why. I mean, I hadn't said or done anything to them. And my mom had the guts to go the next day and speak to the principal. I mean, she didn't even know English. So I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm amazed how she did it. But she went there and she somehow talked with her hands or whatever. And um, it didn't happen again. This principal said, for some reason, the girls thought I was German. I can't imagine. But that was the ex explanation. That was the explanation. They thought you were German, so they beat you up. Right. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But whatever. Josie, um, your mother, Fanny, your husband, Freddie, uh, and you, you're, you're each Holocaust survivors, and you all are part of our first person program. Not only does your mother come here on Sundays, but she was last with us at age 100 on the stage like you are last year in 2017. Right. Um, I, I think everybody here would agree that it's extraordinary that all three of you um, yeah. speak. What is, what is that like for you to know that you, your mom still talks publicly, yeah. um, your husband does? What, what is that like for all of you? Um, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. First of all, it shows me that people are interested. Mm -hmm. They want to know what happened, and they need to know. And I'm always amazed when I go to schools, the amount of reading that the kids do um, on the Holocaust from seventh grade on, um, they're pretty well versed, and I think it's so important. And I feel really good being able to go to schools um, and talk to the kids and have them ask me questions and ask them, you know, what do they think of all this? And I think it's very, very important. I really do. And I feel I'm really doing something positive. People have to know what happened. It, it, when did you, as a family, your mother, for example, and you, when did you start talking about what you went through? You know, that's interesting. My mom really didn't start till the age of 50. Uh, when we first came here, she actually wanted to talk. She tried to talk to some of the relatives, and they didn't want to hear her. They said, you know, that was bad. That was past. Let's only think about good things now. And so she didn't have the ability, really, to be able to talk. So she didn't start talking. And I, you know, I, I'm not, I didn't always tell my story. I don't think people were interested. If they were good friends, I would, they would somehow find out. But I'm, through my life, I haven't been identified <laughs> by the Holocaust. And, um, but I think it took a long time for people to start talking. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom, I think it took really, it was, it was painful for her. She tried to talk, and I think because she was stopped, she just wasn't, she just didn't anymore. Well, we're so glad that she's able to do it now yeah. and still doing it. Uh, how, how many, do you know how many of your extended family perished in the Holocaust? Um, the exact number, you know, my, my dad's, one of my dad's brothers, his wife, a child, grandparents, um, my grandparents had brothers and sisters, so we have large number. a large number, mm -hmm. I would say at least 12 or more, mm -hmm. and I'm not counting my husband's family. Right, right, right. Um, Josie, what, you worked in child welfare, you were an investigator uh, <laughs> in child abuse cases. Your, your career choice, do you th what you went through uh, as a child during the Holocaust, um, did that influence your, your decisions about your career choice? I'm sure it did. Mm -hmm. um, I've always wanted and felt I needed to protect children. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked in child welfare for 20 years, and uh, which is, I know it's terrible, you see a lot of 
pretty difficult, horrible things, but it's also rewarding. You put kids in a very safe place, and you work with them, and you continue with them. And that's always been very important to me. Thank yeah. you. Josie, um, I, I have many more questions, but I think I'd like to turn to our audience. Okay. How does that sound? And see if you folks have some questions. If you do, we have, we got one hand up there. We're gonna, we have microphones in each aisle, and we ask that you wait till you get the microphone. Try to make your question as brief as you can. I'll do my best to repeat it, just to make sure that we hear it okay. uh, up here, and then jo right. Josie will respond to it. So here we go. This on? Hey. Yeah, so have you had a chance to reconnect with any of the people that have, you know, that hid you and just over the years? Question is, um, yeah. did you have a chance to reconnect with any of those who hid you? Yeah. Um, my husband and I were back in Belgium in 1989. Uh, he was there on business and I joined him. And uh, we, tr we tried to find the family, the de Braquelaires, who saved me. I found the neighbors who uh, were my grandparents' neighbors and friends, and they told me that the entire family, even the little girl who was my age, they had all died. So I don't know of what and what happened, and I tried to find the nuns because I feel they should be recognized and acknowledged, and uh, I've written to the Belgium government, and I can't find, I had the order at that time, and the order that the nuns belonged to, and apparently the order is no longer in existence. And my, my feeling is, my understanding is that when an order diminishes and nuns die, they join another order, and so that order is no longer in existence. So I, I have not been able to reconnect, unfortunately. I've tried, but... Yeah. Good, good question. Thank yeah. you for that. Do we have any other questions? All right. Well, um, you're going to have a you're going to have another chance to ask questions after if you want to. Um, when when we're going to hear again from Josie in a few minutes, a uh, few moments, and when Josie's finished, she's going to remain on the stage, and we welcome uh, any of you. Uh, we welcome you very much to come up on the stage, meet Josie, mm -hmm. um, uh, give her a hug. Get your photograph taken with her or ask her a question so there'll be another opportunity Great. to do that if you would like. Um, one more question before we, we wrap up. Tell us about meeting Freddie, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> All right. Um, Freddie actually grew up in England, um, was born in Vienna, went to England on the kinder transport. I don't know if you've heard about England taking in 10,000 Jewish children, mainly from Germany and Austria. And his parents also had to make that decision to let him go. And uh, Freddie was, grew up with a Christian family in, in England and was also an orphan. He, his parents were murdered. And he, just, he did his studies in England and then went to join the British Merchant Marines and was working as a chief radio officer on an Israeli passenger liner. I went to Israel to study. I had a scholarship. I went to study in Israel for a year and, on, and went by ship. Because in those days, in the, late, in the 50s, you didn't really go by plane. It was very expensive and it was you know, not that common. And so I came back by ship, and um, Freddie was an officer, and he was actually socializing with the passengers, me being one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and we were married a year later. <laughs> and you were married on the ship, right? We were married that on the ship. That wonderful photograph is on the ship, right? Yes. We had actually all our guests, like 150 people. It was catered because, you know, on the passenger liners, they make wonderful food. And so we were married, and actually, I went to settle in Israel with Freddie after we were married. But we actually had a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes? What? 
60, We've been married 60 years. 60 years. <laughs> Is that um, clapping for me or for him? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's for both of you. Um, I want to thank all of you for being with us. I'm going to turn back to Josie in just a moment, but thank you for being with us. We will end our 2018 first-person season tomorrow, uh, but we'll resume again in March of 2019, so we hope you can come back in the future. Um, and all of our programs are available on the museum's YouTube page, so you can see this program with Josie or any others uh, if you would like to, and we hope that you'll do that. Um, when, when Josie's done, um, Sarah, our photographer, is going to come up on the stage and take a photograph of Josie with you as the background. So we want you to be here for that. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, Josie will remain on the stage uh, so you can come up here and meet her if you'd like, like to do that. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. And so with that, I'd like to turn to Josie to close our program. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thank all of you for coming. Thank you for being here. Um, I always like to close the program with this one statement. You'll probably, have any of you gone through the museum yet? Yes? Okay, on the second floor, on the wall there, as you exit the second floor, there's a saying or um, a reading by a uh, Lutheran uh, minister. His name is Martin Neimuller, and he actually writes, it's on the wall on the second floor. When you leave the second floor, when you exit it, just take a notice. To me, it's one of the most important sayings in this museum. It means a lot. Uh, so let me read it to you. Martin Neimuller, by the way, who's, as I mentioned, a Lutheran minister, was very pro-Hitler at the beginning because, you know, Hitler promised so many wonderful things to his citizens. However, when he saw what Hitler was doing, he really changed and actually he was jailed. Um, he didn't die in jail, he died in the 80s, 1980s. But this is what he wrote. First they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. I'm sorry, this really, really gets me. Um, all of you really can make a difference. You can speak out if you see anybody hurting, humiliating, or bullying someone, you can actually interfere, you can make a difference. Each person can make a difference. And you, the young people here, you're really our future. You can make a difference. Thank you.